All diploid organisms start life as a zygote, or fertilized egg. In the span of a couple of days, this single cell multiplies, creating a series of formless masses, including the morula and blastula. Eventually, these masses will differentiate into complex structures. But, what are the mechanisms responsible for this amazing transformation? Well, it turns out that the shaping and maintaining of life has a lot to do with death. <laughs> to be specific, cell death, or apoptosis. In a dramatic fashion, old or unneeded cells commit suicide by activating an intracellular death program. The concept of programmed cell death was first described in 1842 by Karl Vogt, a German scientist. His work piqued several other scientists' interests over the years, but by the end of the 20th century, large gaps in knowledge still remain concerning the components of the control and mechanisms. That is, until a team of three biologists, Sidney Brenner, John Solston, and Robert Horvitz worked together and made major discoveries concerning the genetic regulation of organ development and programmed cell death. The information found was so monumental, in fact, that they were jointly awarded the 2002 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Like with all teams, the success was made possible by each individual's contribution of their unique backgrounds, personalities, skills, and knowledge. In this video, we will be taking you through each of the journeys to discovery, and we will start with the person largely responsible for laying the groundwork of the research, Sidney Brenner. Brenner was born during 1927 in Germiston, South Africa, to Jewish immigrant parents. His father, Cobbler, while unable to read or write, taught himself how to speak five different languages and instilled into his young son the importance of self-education and motivation. Brenner took this to heart, allowing him to excel at academics, finishing the first three years of primary school in one year, and graduating high school at the age of 15. His childhood love of the natural world steered Brenner into pursuing science. In 1942, at the age of 15, he began to study medicine. But, being only 15, he was too young to qualify for the practice of medicine. So he took time to work in several labs. Brenner fell in love with research, so he eventually left the medical world and his dissatisfying OBGYN career. In 1952, he decided to move to Oxford and pursue a postdoctoral position with Jack Dennett and Leslie Orgel, where they were trying to work out, among other things, the structure of DNA. In April 1953, they heard news that Crick and Watson had solved the puzzle, spurring them to drive to Cambridge and see the structure for themselves. Witnessing the birth of molecular biology was a turning point in Brenner's life and led him to work in the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology at Cambridge, where he started working on the project that he would eventually lead to the Nobel Prize. There he first established C. elegans, or the nematode, as a model organism for the study of cell differentiation and organ development. The small size, short generation time, and transparency allowed him and later his colleagues to follow cell division. Renner also messed with the genes of the nematode by inducing mutations with the chemical EMS. By creating these mutations, he discovered genes that had effects on organ development. The next component of the research came from Sir John Sulston. Sulston was born during 1942 in Cambridge. His father, an Anglican preacher, instilled in Solson a love for the natural world, while his mother, a grammar school teacher, encouraged his learning. In high school, a passionate zoology teacher introduced Solston to the molecular biology revolution that was just getting underway. When it came time to pick a degree, he remarked, Science was obvious, since I was uninterested in anything else. Solston worked through college and eventually took a postdoctoral position with Leslie Orgel at the Salk Institution. During his second year working there, Leslie introduced him to Francis Crick, who ended up recruiting him for Sidney Brenner. Despite warnings that Brenner's work wouldn't yield anything useful, Solston accepted the position. In Brenner's lab, Solston got to work mapping out the cell lineage of the adult nematode, which ended up showing the fate of every cell in the worm. But his major contribution was mapping out the embryonic development of the nematode. Many labs had attempted to do so using photography, but the technology in 1980 was not sophisticated enough. This didn't stop Solston, though. Determined to get the information, he meticulously hand-mapped the cell lineage using a microscope. The last component of the research came from Robert Horvitz. Horvitz was born during 1947 in Chicago to first-generation American parents. After high school, he was accepted to MIT, where he went through much of his college career pursuing mathematics and economics. However, Senior year, he was largely undedicated in what he wanted to pursue after graduation. 
It wasn't until a roommate persuaded him into taking a modern biology course that his mind was won over. Horvitz then went on to earn his PhD from Harvard in biology. After graduating, a colleague suggested he look into working with Sidney Brenner in Cambridge. He, of course, took this advice and started up studying the C. elegans genome. His contributions were discovering and characterizing key genes controlling cell death in C. elegans. These included prerequisite genes CED3 and CED4 that initiate cell death, the inhibitory cell death gene CD9, and several other genes responsible for directing the disposal of dead cells. He had shown how these genes interact with each other in the cell death process and that corresponding genes exist in humans. Brenner brought to the table his brilliance, curiosity, perseverance, humor, and eventually laid the foundation for the research. The more reserved Solston used his passion, determination, meticulousness, and patience to hand map every cell of C. elegans. Lastly, Horvitz implemented his analytically inclined mind in part with his fascination for genetic analysis to discover new genes and pathways responsible for apoptosis. When combined, this information laid the groundwork for program cell death and organ development. Each found out what they were passionate about and pursued it relentlessly. They didn't allow themselves to get distracted, which is why they advanced so well in their studies of interest, thus expanding the scientific community in all its wonder. Now, please enjoy short interviews with each of our prize winners. I was a shoemaker, and I was self-taught from a very young age. I graduated high school when I was 15 years old. I had always had a fascination with nature. The thing that really got me started was wonder why petals were different colors, and it just got me fascinated about frogs, plants, animals, insects, all of it. And I wanted to understand nature and human tendencies, and, and so I went to a university to further my education in science. Tell us about your journey to winning the Nobel Prize. Yes. Well, you see, at 15 years old, you're too early to qualify for medical school. So I went to a university, and then I rode my bike, and I took an early bus to school, and I worked in the laboratory doing diffractionations on pigments of flowers. So eventually I did go to medical school, but I failed final examinations because I had always been working in the lab. But eventually I graduated and became an OBGYN. But I absolutely hated how patients became less of patients and more of numbers. And so I came to Oxford in October of 1952. All I wanted to do was research and earn my PhD. Can you tell us about your research with the C. elegans? Well, we realized in the early 1960s that fundamental questions regarding the cell differentiation and organ development were hard to tackle in higher animals. Therefore, a genetically amendable and multicellular model organism that was simpler than mammals was required. The ideal solution provided to be the nematode C. elegans. This worm, approximately one millimeter long, had a short generation time in its transparent, which made it possible to follow cell division directly under the microscope. So we provided the basis in the publication in 1974, which we broke new ground by demonstrating the specific gene mutations that could be induced in the genome of C. elegans by the chemical compound EMS. Different mutations would be linked to those specific genes and to be specific on effective organ development. This combination of genetic analysis and visualization of cell divisions observed under the microscope initiated the discoveries that were awarded. Hi, so um, thank you for meeting with us today. Um, I hope you don't mind if we ask you a few questions to get started off, of course. Do you think you can summarize the component of your research? Of course. Um, so I really built off of Brenner's work with the C. elegans and developed techniques to study uh, the cell divisions in the nematode. From uh, the fertilized egg to about a thousand cells in the adult organism, um, I published a journal in 1976 that described the cell lineage for the part of a nervous system. Um, it showed that the cell lineage in, is invariant in every nematode that the organism underwent exactly the same program of cell division and differentiation. I described the visible steps in the cellular death program and demonstrated 
the mutations of genes participating in this programmed cell death, including the NUC1 gene. Um, I also showed that the protein encoded for the NUC1 gene was required for degradation of the DNA in the dead cell. Do you think you can tell us about your journey on your way to earning the Nobel Prize? <laughs> Well, it, it, it was a, bit, a lot of luck, um, the way that I ended up in this situation. Um, so I just started doing upper-level science classes um, in college, and I started working in a research lab. Colin, one of my colleagues, in the lab that I worked in suggested that I take a postdoc position with Leslie Orgel at the Salk Institution. Um, eventually, Leslie introduced me to Francis Kirk, who interviewed me on behalf of Sidney Brenner, and then by that it only took a little time, and I was picked up by Sydney, where I started working in the small animal study of neurobiology. Um, so I started working with the nematodes. So after that I was just working in Sidney Brenner's lab and I was lucky enough to get in on his amazing research. And um, that's, that's about it. It's about your life and your research you conducted. Of course, go for it. Alright, um, can you tell us about your journey to earning a Nobel Prize? I went to Cambridge University, which is where I met Sulston and Brenner, and I studied C. elegans, and, and so everything in biology is conserved. And so if we figure out the mechanism of how a certain animal works, it can give us a clue as to how another animal works. Um, and so later on we learned that programmed cell death is naturally occurring, and all animals do this. And it led us to discover that genes control this process and cells just don't die because the cells are sick. It can be used to develop new therapies for cancer, um, which, you know, doesn't have enough cell death, and it could find ways to kill old cancer cells, such as in Parkinson's, Huntington's, and several other um, neutral degenerative diseases. We can find new genes and proteins that are involved in neurotransmitters between C. elegans and humans, so by learning about this animal, essentially we're going to be able to learn more about ourselves. By learning about simple organisms, it can give us clues as to higher up level organisms. For example, bacterial viruses are the main mechanism for human heredity, and it leads us to understanding the genetic code and leads to the revolution of genetic engineering. And so, of course, we learned about CED, nine genes and how it protects against programmed cell death during development and BACL2 genes which protect against programmed cell death such as cancer in humans and these two genes they look very similar in their sequences and so that means that there's a similar pathway and this exploded the scientific community in 1992 it made them pay attention to the biomedical community and it became relevant in genetics uh, so can you summarize your component of the research? Absolutely. Um, we identified two bona fide, I guess you could say, death genes. So the first one was CED, and there was CED4. And we showed that functional CED3 and CED4 were a prerequisite for cell death to be executed. So without these genes, you can't have cell death. And we also showed that the human genome contains CED3-like genes. So, we know that most genes are involved in controlling cell death in C. elegans have counterparts in humans, and that was huge. Because it verified that our research that we were doing in the simple organism could be expressed in higher level organisms. Thank you!